This is Philosophy Bites with me, Nigel Warburton. And me, David Edmonds. If you enjoy Philosophy Bites, please support us. We're currently unfunded and all donations would be gratefully received. For details, go to www.philosophybites.com. Nothing is sacred, some people claim. But Roger Scruton wants to defend the notion of the sacred. He's also a defender of fox hunting, the relevance of which will soon become apparent. Roger Scruton, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thank you for inviting me. The topic we're going to focus on is the sacred. What is the sacred? I'd prefer to rephrase the question, what is it to see something as sacred? Many people have experiences that they want to describe in this way, saying that, for me, this aspect of reality, this person, this ritual, this place, this um, state of mind is sacred. And they mean by that something very special. And the question is finding out what they do mean. Well, the concept of the sacred, usually contrasted with the profane, is essentially a religious concept. Yes, but of course that doesn't really get us very far because we don't, haven't yet got an account of what makes something religious. All sorts of people all over the world make the distinction between the sacred and the profane, which has something to do with the distinction between those things which are, as it were, outside the world of ordinary experience and those things which are just part of it, part of the ongoing flow of natural events. Those things that occur either outside or perhaps on the edge of things, people do often identify in these terms. It's as though they stand in awe of them and we want to know quite why and what it is to stand in awe as well. Could you give a personal example of that experience just to be clear about what we're talking about here? Yes, entering a church, a country church, which many people do in their travels, not necessarily as a believer, but just as somebody who's curious, and sensing this stored, accumulated silence. One's apt to think about it, perhaps as the product of prayer, the distillation of need, anxiety, suffering, and perhaps rejoicing too. But the place has a kind of numinous quality, something which makes you think this is a place outside the normal run of events. I've come and I'm entering into communication with a different aspect of the world in entering this place. Philip Larkin's poem, Church Going, has got this experience for an atheist entering a church, and I don't think that's a sacred experience, or an experience of the sacred that he describes quite, is it? He talks about an awkward reverence or something like this, doesn't he? Yes, uh, Larkin actually is a very good example of somebody who did have the concept of the sacred, but didn't believe that it corresponded to any reality. But all his poems are about it, let's face it. You know, something like Wits and Weddings, as you rightly say, church going, these are poems which do describe these places on the edge of things, where you seem to be standing, as it were, facing into the transcendental. He wants to say that there is no transcendental, but nevertheless, that's what you're facing. OK, well, what is the transcendental? That's another one, another term that's come up. You seem to be talking about something beyond the everyday here. Yes. In this discussion of the metaphysics of religion, people use this term all the time to denote entities that are outside space and time with which we enter into relation, either through prayer or through being blessed in some way. And that is the fundamental religious experience and the, it's rationalised through the belief in gods and spirits and so on. But, you know, you don't necessarily have to rationalise it. I argue in the following way, that actually this experience is rooted in something that we can't avoid, which is our experience of each other. When I look at you and engage in a dialogue such as we're engaged in at the moment, I'm not addressing that mouth, those eyes, that flesh. I'm addressing something which is addressing me through that. What is that something? It's this thing that you identify in the first person case as I. I identify in the third person or the second person case. I identify it as you. That thing is already, as it were, on the edge. It's already beyond what can be reached through the understanding of ordinary spatiotemporal events. We have that sense that we are addressing ourselves to the other and in doing so there is no part of him, no physically identifiable 
element that can be described as the other, the thing that we can reach and take hold of. He is, as it were, addressing us through those things. This is what I call the overreaching intentionality of the interpersonal, that we are constantly looking beyond what is given to us in the physical reality of another person's presence to that thing which speaks to us through his mouth and addresses it us through his gaze. A lot of philosophers have commented on this in one way or another, Sartre famously, in Being and Nothingness. But of course Sartre says that that thing that we address in the other, which is his freedom, is also a nothingness. And that's another way, perhaps, of putting it, the metaphysical problem. This thing that we confront in confronting each other is not something that can be put into the ordinary conceptual scheme through which we negotiate our way through the world. So I want to say that that fundamental experience, the interpersonal experience, is, as it were, the root of this more general experience that we have of the world as such, as containing these points from which we are observed. That sounds like a kind of anthropomorphism, projecting human qualities onto objects in the world. That's one way of looking at it, but anthropomorphism is not the simple thing that you're trying to make out. When I look at a picture, say the Mona Lisa, I see a collection of pigments spread on a piece of That's not all I see. I see in those pigments this extraordinary face which addresses me with a, an enigmatic smile that has bewildered people down the centuries. If you like, that smile contains all kinds of things which are meaningful to me, and all kinds of knowledge of myself which is made available to me by that look. And in just that way, the world as a whole contains all kinds of, if you like, instructions to us which we may respond to or we may ignore. Now you as a, a well-meaning, old-fashioned physicalist will say that these are just projections, but I will say, look, they're no more projections than the Mona Lisa is, and that a person who looks at that painting and sees only pigments, which is all there is there from the physical point of view, is someone who hasn't seen everything. In particular, hasn't seen that he is himself being seen. I think there's a difference between entertaining the idea that you're being looked at by a portrait and genuinely believing you're being seen. Yes, of course there is. The one's a work of imagination, the other is the work of the more literal-minded sort of perceptions that guide us through our day-to-day -day lives. But I want to say that the imagination is not so epistemologically empty as old-fashioned empiricist types want to say. Of course, when we get to the limit of what we can know through the senses, then we've got to the limit. And the attempt to get beyond it and grasp the transcendental is, in some sense, withheld from us. I agree with that. And after all, that's the whole argument of Kant's first critique. But Kant also says, and I think rightly, that there is contained within our habits of thought something which always reaches beyond. It's pointing beyond, but it can't actually get beyond. And I think that that's one of the roles of the imagination in the life of a rational being, to point beyond to that thing which can't be described, but nevertheless in which we are in some kind of relation. I'm still unclear whether you think there could be an experience of the sacred that is valuable and life-transforming, but which is just a product of human psychology? Mm. Well, everything that goes on in our minds is just a product of human psychology. That's a tautology. The question that you're asking, really, is whether this sense of reaching beyond the empirical world has any underlying justification, validation. And I would say, yes, it does. And I agree with Wagner, that's the business of art, to give it that validation. OK, that you might want to stop short of faith or commitment of any kind, but, you know, if you're a Kantian, you have to stop short of that. For the reasons that Kant makes abundantly clear, reason cannot reach that far. So the sacred occupies a space where reason stops rather than being something you can engage with rationally? Yes and no. Reason stops, of course, at, at the threshold of the transcendental, it must. But 
you can still engage with it rationally, and Kant's view was that you did so by obeying the moral law. The moral law was the thing that then took over, as it were. But I want to say, no, it's, it's more complex than that. There are all kinds of ways of engaging with that which cannot be reached through reason. We make a space for it in our lives through this way of understanding the world. There are a lot of things that we make space for in that way which get dropped by the scientific worldview. We make space for colours, we make space, as I said, for aspects like pictures, we make space for music. There's nothing in, um, in the physical world which corresponds to the experience of music. Now, there are sounds, there are sequences of sounds, but what we hear in those sequences are things like melodies, harmonies, tension and release, great contests of forces. Physics has no room for those. You've talked about the sacred, but you've also talked about things which are in the realm of transcendence, yeah. and those two categories don't necessarily overlap entirely. No. You're absolutely right. We've only made a few fast moves. You referred earlier to this distinction between the sacred and the profane. I think more interesting for us in this the modern situation which we find ourselves is the distinction between the sacred and the desecrated, or the consecrated and the desecrated. There are a lot of things that we feel, even atheists feel, which need those concepts to identify them. The desecration of sex by pornography, for instance, you can't put it in any other way, really, what it is that people feel as a result of being exposed to this, that something has been pulled down, sullied, removed from the world of ideals and rolled in the gutter and all the rest. You know, those ways of describing things actually already engage with this notion of desecration. And you can desecrate a corpse, you can desecrate your marriage, or all these things. We know that this can happen. So there is a, a contrast that we perhaps need in order to understand the full complexity of our moral experience. And yet you don't think you desecrate a fox by chasing it across a field? That's a very interesting question. You would, certainly if you chased it across a field and then perhaps shot it and tore it to pieces in some sadistic way. I think that we all have this sense that the moment of death and the way of death, even for an animal, is something where the contrast between the sacred and the desecrated is very vivid. Why else is there halal butchery? What is it to do with except that, that the moment of death is sacred and has to be done properly? Two people might quite easily disagree about which things are sacred. Yes, of course. I think this is a, a very important observation. People disagree about an awful lot of things. The question is not whether there is some reality which settles it, but whether there is a process of approximation whereby people can come to agree. Of course, in many ways, the sacred is a human creation. We create it from the totality of our relations with others. It's a partly a community building thing and religions therefore differ. They have different rituals. There are different moments that are significant. We all respect that in other religions that are not our own, you know, that we would take our shoes off when going into a mosque, even though we wouldn't when going into a church and this sort of thing. These are perfectly reasonable things to do, but nevertheless the whole human species shares the sense that certain events are events which automatically bring this distinction between the sacred and the desecrated into play. But the same kind of feeling is the feeling that leads people to stone an, an adulterer or an apostate. Yes, absolutely. It's a dangerous feeling. But the question is, um, by getting rid of it completely, would we be any better with solving these particular questions you know, how, of how to respond to adultery, how to respond to apostasy, probably we wouldn't. We've talked a lot about the sacred. For many people, the sacred is dependent on an idea of there being a God. Mm. And if there is no God, I can still have profound experiences in all kinds of situations. But they're different because there is nothing beyond this world. Yes. From the beginning of the Romantic movement, poets, painters, musicians have devoted their attention to, as it were, immortalising those moments of meaning without implying that there is some transcendent being 
who is trying to communicate with us through them. Wordsworth did think there was some kind of transcendent being, but he is valued by us today because uh, his poetry makes sense without it. So you're absolutely right that these moments of meaning don't require the ontological commitments of a particular faith. Wittgenstein famously said, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one should remain silent. And there is a view that if something's unsayable, it's unsayable, you can't talk about it. Mm. I agree, but philosophers are not very good at shutting up. Kierkegaard wrote sort of a million words devoted to truth as subjectivity, in other words, the unsayableness of truth. Likewise, Schopenhauer, 500,000 words on the will, which can't be put into concepts. I'm just a rather more modest version of the same thing, although I admit that we, we can't say in words what the essence of this experience is. We can give examples and we can show through music and painting and architecture and so on just how it is that the sacred becomes a real presence in our world. Roger Scruton, thank you very much. Thank you. For more Philosophy Bites, go to www.philosophybites.com. You can also find details there of Philosophy Bites books and how to support us.